Hello, my name is Lydia Beer and I'm a senior in the biology department. My research this summer with graduate student Angie Leonard and Dr. Sarah Diamond of the biology department was, does diet breath resolve variation in climate-driven rain shifts of Ohio butterflies? Climate change is a big problem that affects many species globally, uh, almost universally. Um, many species are taking certain measures to try and account for the rising global temperatures in their historic ranges. One of these methods is a shift in their geographic range, which we call rain shifts. Because their ancestral range has gotten too warm for them, they try and move to cooler times to maintain that same niche that they've always lived in, that they can survive in. Um, generally, these rain shift responses tend to be poleward or upslope, so towards cooler latitudes. But lots of variation exists in both the magnitude and the direction of these rain shift responses. Uh, poleward and upslope towards a higher elevation is a general trend, not a rule for every species. Theory suggests that specialization may constrain these rain shifts, so certain factors such as predators or competitors or resources availability may affect the direction or the magnitude of these rain shift responses. The, what we're going to be focusing on here is the diet breath of Ohio butterflies. So butterflies have a certain range of plants, called host plants, on which they lay their eggs and rear their larvae. Some butterfly species have a very narrow range of host plants, some have a very broad range of host plants. So here we hypothesize that rain shift responses will depend on the degree of specialization in host plant usage, so their diet breadth. We predict that species with a more narrow diet breadth will show a greater rain shift response, whereas species with a broader diet breadth will show less of a rain shift response. So how did we do this? We examined 85 native butterfly species. So the latitudinal rain shifts were calculated using long-term community monitoring data from the Ohio Lepidopterous Society. So these rain shifts are a linear rate of change in the degrees of latitude that species have moved per year. Um, a positive value indicates a poleward change, whereas a negative value indicates an equatorial change. Um, diet breadth we calculated using published data of databases and nature journals of suitable host plants for each butterfly species. Um, for each, and we calculated these, we tabulated using species and using genera. So for each species of host plant that was recorded for a butterfly species, that was one. So we counted up how many species and how many genuses of host plants we could find for each butterfly species. Um, here we've got the monarch butterfly, which is very commonly associated with milkweed, which is where a lot of their larvae are found, and they had a relatively uh, narrow uh, host plant range, whereas some species had a very broad host plant range. For example, the painted lady had the biggest diet breadth at 141 species that it used. So we define diet specialization as the number of host plant species, so we calculated it into a number. We examined the relationship between these rain shift values and the diet breadth values as both a linear correlation and using a phylogenetically informed model that used the relationship between different butterfly species to examine how that might relate to their rain shifts and their diet breaths. So, onto our results. Our first figure here is a phylogeny created by Dr. Diamond of the 85 butterfly species. Here we can see that uh, they're divided up by family. Um, as you can see, poleward shifts are represented by the orange color and equatorial shifts are, are represented by the blue color. You can see there's a lot of variation in responses, even between closely related species. Um, family, so the relationship of family in this phylogeny did not have an effect on how uh, species responded to uh, in the form of their rain shifts. Um, there's a lot of variation. Um, no, uh, many species respond in different ways even though they're closely related. So there was not a phylogenetic relationship between the rain shifts and the phylogeny. So, but what does explain these uh, variations? So that brings us to our second figure, which we're looking at, does diet breath resolve this variation? Um, as we can see, we have two graphs here. The one on the right is uh, host plants by gen genera, and the one on the left is host plants by species. Um, I'll start with the one on the left. So as we can see on the y-axis, we've got rain shift responses. Um, just like in figure one, um, poleward responses are represented in orange and equatorial. 
factorial responses are represented in blue. And on the x-axis, we've got um, diet breadth calculated by species. And on the right, we've got diet breadth calculated by genera. So as we can see, there's not much of a correlation here. Um, uh, high p-value, um, not much of a trend in either direction. Um, so we can conclude that diet breadth doesn't resolve this range of variation. So this brings us to our conclusions. Um, we found variation in butterfly range of responses, but diet specialization did not resolve this. Whether we looked at diet breadth by species or by genera, it still didn't resolve it. Um, uh, we looked at phylogenetic signal, so how butterfly species are related, related to their diet breadth. It was, we found it to be moderate, so there is further potential research to be done in studying how the butterfly phylogeny relates to diet breadth. There is a lot of potential for future work here. There are so many other areas of specialization, like I mentioned in the introduction. There are competitors and predators and so many other resources that butterflies use and so many other species use that we can look to see if they explain why species are moving in the way that they are. Even just looking at different ways of calculating diet breadth, for example, incorporating the plant phylogeny, how the host plants are related to each other, could reveal some kind of association as to why species are moving the way that they are. So there's a lot of future work to be done to examine what factors accept these, uh, explain these climate change uh, responses that we're seeing in so many species all over the globe. Before I end, I'd like to thank the Ohio Lepidopterous Society and the Cleveland Museum of Natural History and the University Farm. Um, without all their hard work, this research would have never been possible. And I would like to thank Source and all their funders, including the university and the Case Alumni Association, for allowing me this awesome opportunity that I've had. Thank you very much.